Hey everyone, my name is Alejandro Gebb and I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist from Chile. Today I'll give you some basic information about intersex or DSD and some tips on how to support this particular population. Let's start by checking some basics about sexual development. How do we know a baby's male or female? When babies are born, we assign their sex based on the visual inspections of their external genitalia. Why do we do this? Because that is usually linked to other sexual characteristics that are harder to see, like chromosomes, hormones, and internal organs. For example, a penis is usually related to XY chromosomes, a higher level of androgens, and the internal presence of testicles, a prostate, and other organs. While a vulva is usually related to XX chromosomes, a lower level of androgens, and the internal presence of an uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries, amongst others. The key word here is usually, because it's not always like this. Variations in any of these physical characteristics means bodies don't fall into the binary categories that we use to define sex as male or female. As an example, people with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome have XY chromosomes, high level of androgens, testicles where ovaries typically are, no uterus, and a vulva. When variations outside the first two scenarios happens, we say there is a difference in sexual development, or DSD for short, that leads to being intersex. This also means that we will require more information and tests to understand the baby's biology and predict their development and health needs. So what is and what isn't intersex? Intersex is an umbrella term used to describe a wide range of variations and diversity of sex. For some people, being intersex is an important part of their identity, while for others it can be anecdotal. Intersex and DSD are the current preferred terms and are used by most members of their communities, usually with some preference of one over the other. Knowing that someone is intersex doesn't give you information about their gender identity or sexual orientation. Remember, we are talking about a person's diversity in sexual development, not their romantic and sexual preference or internal sense of gender. But the thing sexual, gender and sex diversity have in common is that they are not considered pathological. Let's check some important characteristics of intersexuality. Up to 1.7% of people have intersex characteristics, which means around 1 in every 50 people born fit in this category. Most of them will not have medical issues, so being intersex doesn't mean you will need hormones, surgery, or have difficulties conceiving. Studying where you fit in the intersex spectrum can be useful to know if you need support. How to perform the study should be guided by a multidisciplinary medical team and can include external, external physical examination, imaging for internal organs, karyotype test, which means looking at your chromosomes, blood tests, and hormone measurements. As I said before, intersex is an umbrella term or a spectrum. Not everyone has different intergenitals and some don't discover their condition for years. In some cases, they might only be called clear at poverty, when trying to conceive, or by chance. We also estimate that a lot of people with intersex variations are not aware of them. Most intersex people grow up to identify as boy or girls, but you should leave room for trans and non-binary identities, as should be with every person. Depending on the genetics and hormone profile of the particular condition a person has, Probabilities of identifying as a man, woman, or non-binary can vary, but no one can predict a person's gender for sure, so let them tell you. We will expand on this later. Finally, if we protect intersex people from some specific form of maltreatment and oppression, their well-being and health should be as good as everyone else. What are some of the most common issues affecting the intersex community today? Number one, concealing. This comes from an old myth that somehow, knowing they were born with intersex characteristics, 
will affect the psychological development of children. That led to the concealing of medical records about interventions and recommendations for parents to not tell their children about procedures when they grew up. This myth is now debunked. Knowing you have or had intersex characteristics don't do harm. And we now know that concealing is more damaging and a violation of human rights, by the way. Number two, stigma. The tendency to categorize all people as either female or male means that people with intersex variations might face social stigma and discrimination. Even before expressing your gender, differences are assumed based on sex. This can range from what is allowed to be given as a present, to what toilet to use, schools to go to, clothes to wear, color preference, etc. This puts a lot of pressure on intersex people and also parents caring for an intersex child. Things like growing up hearing that your body has a problem or being asked inappropriate questions about your genitals can lead you to internalize a negative self-image and consequently poor mental health. Number three, surgery. In a small number of cases, early surgery may be necessary, such as to assist bladder or bowel functions and to preserve fertility. But in most cases, what we call correcting or normalizing surgeries are used to make people fit in what male or female anatomy typically looks like. This is usually done at early age when children can't consent. And what we know from intersex adults is that they will rather wait until they are older to decide if procedures with cosmetic purpose are desired. So, what can we do to protect and advocate for intersex people? Now we will discuss 10 recommendations based on the clinical experience working with this population, studies where they have asked intersex people about their needs, and what activists are asking today. Recommendation 1. Honesty. This is mainly focused on not concealing information, as we said that is one of the issues that can lead to mental health problems. As clinicians, don't hide or erase medical records, and as parents, don't lie about medical procedures performed or the underlying causes of them. Try to explain to children in their words what is special about them, how it is different but not negative, and answer their questions. Recommendation 2. Promote client and family-centered care within multidisciplinary teams. As you can deduct from this presentation, intersex care usually requires a range of doctors like geneticists, endocrinologists, urologists, gynecologists, psychologists, and pediatricians, among others. This can be tough, since there is a deficit in education about intersex issues, and enough resources to assemble a team of various specialists can be hard to get. As clinicians, Look for allies in your clinical center and ask them about their experiences with intersex clients. Share training resources and engage them in intersex care when you have clients. Also, remember your client is the main focus here. Be mindful that they understand what is being discussed, how this can cause an impact on them or their family, and address their concerns. As a client or a parent of an intersex child, Ask about the resources available in your clinic and suggest via formal channels to have a multidisciplinary team if they don't have one. Recommendation 3. Respect for privacy in all settings. Most people understand it is rude to ask or talk about other people's private parts, but feel entitled to ask about their bodies to people with diverse developments. This is especially true in clinical settings, where we sometimes ask questions that are not always relevant. In clinical settings, do not expose as rare cases to students or other clinicians, and be mindful of what you ask. In family or school settings, don't share unnecessary details and discuss who your child wants to share information with. In every setting, avoid shaming that comes from words like normal, abnormal, pathological, and prefer speaking from difference and diversity. Also. Avoid generalizations with phrases like 
every girl gets their period or something like that and anything that translates to a fixed way of being a boy or a girl. Recommendation 4. Be prepared to answer the most common questions. When a child is born or even during pregnancy, one of the first questions is if the baby is a boy or a girl. For parents of intersex children, it can be stressful to answer the string of follow-up questions after they say that they are not sure or that the baby doesn't fit into binary categories. You can work on this by role-playing with health professionals or asking the community how they deal with this issue. For children and intersex people, this can also mean being prepared to choose whether to answer or not to people's question. Role-playing can also be used for, for this. Parents have a lot of questions regarding gender development, future fertility, diagnosis and medical procedures amongst others. It is important for clinicians to discuss these issues and have some answer before clinical encounters. Remember that intersex is an umbrella of different conditions. I highly recommend every clinician to know about the most common conditions like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, obotestigular DSD, androgen insensitivity syndrome, and androgen biosynthesis DSD. But keep in mind that some cases don't fit neatly in our categories. So it's always a good idea to discuss as a multidisciplinary team the particularities of the clients before talking to parents. Recommendation 5. Be careful about clinical and surgical procedures. As we said before, surgical interventions are a major issue affecting intersex people's lives. Don't rush or feel rushed to decide unless it is a vital procedure. When planning an intervention, it is important that clinicians parents and clients ask some questions to decide if the procedure is needed. Is this just cosmetic? Can the person the surgery will be performed on give consent? Can it be postponed until the person can express their consent? What do adults with similar conditions think about the procedure? Answering these questions can help you to take a better decision. I will also encourage you to check if there is a ban on normalizing surgeries in your territory. Recommendation 6. Explore feelings and thoughts after clinical encounters. Being labeled as wrong, abnormal or disordered can have lasting effects. For clinicians, this is a reminder to avoid pathologization and shaming. Mental health professionals should explore with their clients and families how they felt after clinical encounters to reinforce affirmative concepts and correct pathologization or shaming. Families should also leave the doors open to children to express how they felt once outside clinical spaces. If something went wrong, feel free to discuss it with the medical team before the next appointment. Recommendation 7. Promote diversity as positive and advocate for awareness. As we said before, some of the stigma around intersexuality derives from binary rigid notions around sexual development and the body. These ideas are usually linked to other against other forms of diversity. Working as a community to advocate for diversity in their different forms give us strengths. Part of the stigma also comes from misinformation. Raising awareness about intersexuality and issues affecting intersexual people is a good way to prevent the stigma derived from misinformation. Finally, stigma can be avoided by laws supporting intersex people. Banning normalizing surgeries on children, appropriate legal documentation, and anti-discrimination laws are usually causes intersex people are defending around the world. Check their status in your country and how can you support those fights. Recommendation 8. Connect to peer and parent groups. Community is the antidote for shame. Parents and intersex people that participate in community groups report higher well-being and satisfaction. There is a high chance that some of the problems or doubts you have are also encountered by others in the community, and their experience can be valuable to you. I highly recommend you at least give it a try. If you are a clinician, Keep an up-to-date list of organizations working with intersex people in your territory and refer your clients and their families. Working with community groups is also a great experience for clinicians to so offer some help and attend open meetings. Recommendation 9. Let children tell you about their gender. This can be a recommendation for everyone raising kids, 
but I will highlight its relevance for intersex children. In most cases, we can predict the most common outcome for the gender identity of a child and make a recommendation of raising them as boy or girls, but there is always a chance of transgender and non-binary identities. This chance can be higher than the general population in some intersex conditions. As an example, up to 5% of those assigned female at birth born with congenital adrenal hyperplasia will identify as men, which is higher than the general population. Some cases are outside described syndromes and are unique in their characteristics, so we can make a statistical prediction based on their biology. Parents can also choose the option of doing a gender neutral parenting, which we don't have a lot of systematized information, but you can find a lot of anecdotal experiences published online with good results. This option should be considered especially in cases with high uncertainty. I encourage clinicians to know some basics about gender development and guide par parents as children grow up. Usually, we can see gender-oriented preferences in terms of toys and clothing around the ages of 2 and 3. Between the ages of 3 and 4, children usually can speak about their gender and preferences become more clear. Their capacity to tell us about their gender increases as verbal language becomes the main way of communicating, and there is openness to allow them to explore. Be open to what they are saying and remember that the ideas around binarism are not har only harmful when applied to sexual development, but also gender. Recommendation 10. Listen to and amplify intersex voices. There is a lot of activism happening around intersexuality being done by people from the intersex community. I think the best way to address the issues and be an ally for a community is to listen directly to what they have to say. I leave you some websites and organizations to follow. Brújula Intersexual and Comunidad Intersex Pacifico Sur have great resources in Spanish. In English, I will recommend you DST Families, Interleague, and Intersex Human Rights Australia. Be sure to check their web page and social network. Thanks for watching.